So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am uh, honored to uh, meet you all today. I met some of you yesterday, and for those who've seen this part of the conversation, um, my apologies, but I want to make sure that I uh, introduce who I am uh, and who Sunlight is, if you're not aware of this. So uh, a long time ago, there was a Supreme Court justice named Louis Brandeis who said famously that sunlight is said to be the best disinfectant. And that is where the name of the Sunlight Foundation comes from. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit that uses uh, several different ways to try to make government and politics more participatory, transparent, and accountable to the public it serves. That's open data, something that you all know a great deal about, uh, activism and policy, journalism, and technology itself. Start from the premise that open government data is in the DNA of the United States. It's in our constitution. In the part that says that there shall be an enumeration of the people, that being the US Census. The US Census Bureau is the original open data agency. There have been many that have followed since then, scientific agencies, regulatory agencies, all the agencies that deal with our laws, our ethics, uh, certainly our Congress, so you can make a case that the judiciary as well, though they're not quite as good at it. But this is an idea that's been around for a long time, and it's a simple idea, but a powerful one. Knowledge created of, by, and for the people should be available to the people, something that all of you are dedicated to. Uh, the difference, of course, is that today, this device has changed how data can be used, how it can be created, how it can be shared. The, th the incredible talk we just heard about commons, I think, drives home how open data can be, how much of a public resource it can be. We were founded over a decade ago with a mission to bring us to this point, not just to hold the White House accountable for its commitments, not just to put a, a great deal of, of uh, uh, light upon our politics using these different tools, but to actually try to change the way that the government discloses information, to change the way it uses that information. And we still believe this basic credo that combining open data and open source software make governments more open, accountable, transparent, collaborative, and effective. And I'd argue that the past decade has proved that hypothesis to be true. Something that people who care about the scientific method believe in. And as these ideas have moved around the globe, we've seen this taken up. We've seen states and cities and counties and countries put information on the internet in a way that people can use and then see it be reused and reshaped and see how governments shift, how they build by and maintain technology. And as a result, now we have this expectation. We have a default that if you put something on the internet, it should be open government data. Congress has bought into that idea. Other countries have bought into that idea. It is a bipartisan, nonpartisan ideal. The culture of government has shifted. It's not to say it's shifted everywhere. It's not to say everyone knows what these things are. It's not to say everyone is bought into these ideas or that they can't be rolled back because progress in the arc of our history goes back and forth as we have seen this past year. But the idea that you should bring data to the table when you're making decisions about public policy and that that data should be something that is accessible to the public to back it up, I think that has now moved beyond theory to reality. So how did we help get there? This is where I beat the drum for the sunlight a little bit. Well, in 2005, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find an open data policies in cities, states, much less the United States. Now dozens of countries and cities and states have such policies. They have platforms and we've helped write them and we've helped influence them. We've helped create more than 60 open data policies in cities around this country. We're now working with 40 different governments with more to come and we're trying to help them now move beyond just writing the policy to doing it better, to connecting this idea that if you release data and you do it in certain ways to certain places, that it can improve how government works by, for, of, and crucially with the people. We've helped build the platforms of data. We put out good policies. We've helped thousands of reporters understand campaign finance data, lobbying data, influence data, scientific data, any kind of data that's out there, follow the money, report on influence. Our tools over the last decade served billions of calls to our APIs. Many of those tools have now been moved on, in fact, all of them have, um, to other nonprofits as we shut down our labs last year. 
um, places like the Marshall Project, ProPublica, Pro um, who are continuing to maintain civic infrastructure. And our advocacy has changed disclosure as well. Uh, we won a, won a recent victory in the past week, in fact, where the Federal Communications Commission is including more information about who is buying political ads into the, uh, and they're mandating that local stations include that information. Now we'll see how that holds up in this next FCC. But the idea that if we're going to make money speech and that money is going to support advertising, well, if you're going to have that and you've got to have disclosure, the Chief Justice of the United States has said that disclosure through online websites in his decision is a necessary counterbalance to this idea. So if that's true, then disclosure is paramount and disclosure has to be done in an open way. We've helped the public understand the public, which is to say analyzed open data that the FCC has itself released, creating knowledge that helped enact historic open internet order, codifying the principle of net neutrality. And we pushed the FEC to improve how it discloses campaign finance data. Just look at open.fec.gov today. The U.S. now has a federal source code policy. 20%, 20% of the software that goes out there should be open source. That means that you can look at the source itself. That means that um, openness is baked in. I think that will change and bend the cost curve that we see. It will change how government agencies can collaborate with one another. And it will move innovation that's bought and paid for at the federal level down to the state and local level when it makes sense. And we've helped, I think, to push the idea that people who create civic technology, who are civic technologists, those who create technology for good, have showed and demonstrated to government how to do it better, how to build the change they wish to see in the world, building not just for the public but with them, and ideally seeing that innovation move into government itself. And in fact, many of Sunlight Labs alumni work for the government now. They've gone into service to try to make the ideas and the platforms and the technologies and the ways of disclosure that they pushed for outside of the government now be baked into the way government itself works. And they're winning. And we are very proud of them. And we've showed some teeth at times too. We've held the Obama administration accountable repeatedly again and again and again over the past eight years. One of the most important ways is something that I think is near and dear to many people's hearts here, which is a making sure that they know what they have and telling the public about it through enterprise data inventories. You cannot manage things unless you know what you have. You cannot measure them. You cannot most crucially protect them. Does anybody think that the U.S. Office of Personal Management would have had the same posture towards the sensitive data, the crown jewels they had if they had mapped out all of their data and understood the different sensitivity levels? I think things would be different. That is going to be paramount in the years to come as well. We've also held the government accountable for following through on its promises about open government itself. Open government directive in 2009, executive order from the president, you're supposed to do things, but of course agencies are quite practiced and sometimes not quite hearing that. And national action plan for open government, something that's part of the open government partnership, We've held them accountable for following through in those plans and initiatives. Last September, half the cabinet agencies did not comply with a direct order from the White House Office of Management and Budget, from the US CIO and the US CTO. Now, 13 of 15 agencies do after we cast some sunlight on that. 22 of the 24 agencies subject to the Chief Financial Officers Act do as well. The agencies that we looked at that are not subject to that for whom compliance was voluntary, have not posted a plan. And we hope that they will do so, so there will be a baseline for open government, a baseline for self-assessments, and a baseline for progress over the past 10 years, so that we can all see how it changes one way or the other in the years to come. And we've been at the center of coalitions for change. Change does not happen with one person or one organization alone. It comes with all of us doing something together. Well, back in 2006, two senators, one of whom went on to become a president, wrote a piece of legislation that established something called USAspending.gov. 
But it turns out that the data on it, that being how that we are spending our treasure, taxpayers' dollars, wasn't so good. We built a site called clearspending.org, which showed a pretty big problem in the quality of that spending data. That insight enabled a coalition to advocate for something called the Data Act, which was passed unanimously in both houses and signed into law in 2014. That is now something you can see enacted and implemented in the open at openbeta.usaspending.gov. And that's not going to disappear. We'll see what happens. But I think that unanimous votes of Congress to make spending data open, transparent, and accountable to the people is not something that's going to disappear from this earth anytime soon. Congress itself has been opened up. Congress itself has been made more transparent. And again, it has been a bipartisan approach, a coalition-driven approach. Extraordinarily so. If you've actually gone to the congressional hackathons, yes, Congress has held hackathons. The last one even had people coding in the people's house. They've managed to done their rules enough to make that occur. And the idea that the American people should be able to not only see the laws online, but to see the progress of those laws is something that has been built and advocated for by people outside of government in collaboration with people inside of government to the point that there's something called a bulk data task force. The public can attend and see what's happening. If you want to see dedicated public servants who don't get a lot of credit, go to that. Participate in it. See how much progress that they've made. We helped show what could be possible, scraping data from Thomas.gov, building Open Congress, releasing open data for public use. Josh Taubrier built GovTrack. We still celebrate his work today, showing what could be done if you open up data. The Congressional Data Coalition, which we participate in, is advocating for more fundamental change, asking Congress to do better. And now the general the government printing office discloses legislative bulk data in XML every four hours. And it enables reuse outside of government in ways that government itself may not be able to do. And I encourage you again to see govtrack.us and see ProPublica's represent us. We helped to push for Freedom of Information Act reform, which we finally got through last year, just in time. And there's now a presumption of openness in the US code. There's a so-called Beetlejuice rule. Anything that's re or requested three times has to be released in electronic format. <laughs> and now there is a policy that I think eventually they're going to get out. It was supposed to be done by the first, but again, not everyone is always on deadline when the president says go. We're a release to one, release to all approach to releasing documents and data means that it won't just go to an individual reporter, it won't just go to an individual commercial requester or a nonprofit or anyone else, it will be released to the public as well as them. You will see a connection finally between that which we are asking for and that which we all get to see. Will compliance be perfect? Will implementation be perfect? Will there be lots of speed bumps along the way? Of course there will. You should have seen the Chief FOIA Officers Council's first meeting when they are all confronted with this potential policy. But that is now the new normal. It will become the new reality. We expect to watch very carefully to see if and when people try to skirt it. What's next? This is maybe the question, right? This is the thing that I'm certainly thinking a lot about, we are thinking about, our allies are thinking about, the rest of the world is thinking about. And I will be disingenuous if I told you I knew. I've been in the media for the past decade. I know enough after the past year to be very careful about predictions. But here's what I think is going to happen. I think Congress is going to enact the Open Government Data Act. Why? Because the Senate passed it unanimously in December. Now we're in the 115th Congress. But that is such a big vote for saying that open government data should be the law of the land, that enterprise data inventories are the right approach, that something like data.gov is the right thing to have around, that government agencies and their CIOs 
and their data officers should be using that data, that they should be reporting back to Congress, that you should be measuring their progress, that this part of the president's legacy is worth keeping because everyone agrees that that which is created with taxpayer dollars should be made available to the public unless it, one of those exemptions in the FOIA says don't do it. And there's a lot of gray areas in right there, a lot of gray areas around privacy, around security. Well, it's very important that we think carefully about how the so-called mosaic effect could be used to hold back data as a rationale. It's important to think about the risks of layering multiple data sets on each other too. We want to make sure that what we just described in that release to one, release to all approach is actually part of our nation's approach where FOIA.gov is the portal that Congress has now directed the Office of Management and Budget to create, that that itself is open and that drives data disclosures. And we think that will get rid of the disconnect between governments releasing what they want to versus what they don't. We want to make sure that if data.gov endures, and we expect it to now, that the links aren't bad and they're not just PDFs. We want to make sure that also other approaches to releasing data inform us about issues that are of national and international significance. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you think foreign influence is a matter of national concern right now, but it's fair to say it's on our minds. The Foreign Agents Registration Act is something that Justice Department, Justice Department is supposed to administer. It's expressed at fair.gov and that site's full of PDFs. They're scanned images. It's outrageous. You've told Congress that they should fix it. You've told the Justice Department they should fix it. If this next administration is really serious about informing the public, they will. They'll set up a structured way of collecting that data and they'll be disclosing it as we go and making it much easier to connect who exactly is doing what in our nation's capital and where they come from. This one slide could be the whole talk. It's the thing. I think our nation's checkbook is going to remain as open data. But there's a lot of other data that will be in contention. I was privileged yesterday to hear talks from the USDA, the USGS, USGS and NOAA. Dedicated civil servants working hard to publish scientific data with rigor, with periodicity, with frequency, with high access, with high quality, trying to understand who's using it, how they're using it to improve public knowledge of science, to improve government policy. They are the backbone of our nation in so many important ways. And for those of you who are here and who serve in the roles, the roles we thank you. And we are here for you. We have seen what has happened in nations whose leaders do not value science in the same way, whose leaders cast doubt upon the rigor of science, whose leaders cast doubt upon consensus around issues like climate change, like the efficacy of vaccines. We've seen what's happened north of the border when they have made the census in Canada voluntary. A nation stopped being able to know itself as well. It had an impact upon the business world, it had an impact upon journalism world, it had an impact upon public knowledge. How can you make better public policy if you don't understand the nation itself? That is what is at stake with census data. How can you understand what's happening with your economic? activity if you don't accurately measure the data from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics? How would you understand how justice itself is being carried out by the nation's law enforcement officers if you do not measure the use of force, if you do not have a standard for what force means? These are the questions that will be central in the years ahead. Now I understand that this conference is focused upon science. 
And I believe that science should be above partisan politics. I was trained as a biologist. So I have a lot of love for you all. But the reality is that science has become politicized. The communications about science have become politicized. And that data itself should be the thing that we all rally around to create shared facts about what's happening to our planet, to one another, to public health, to our traffic, to our environment, to our wildlife, to our children. And that creating and maintaining it and publishing it is in the public interest. We live in a moment where the idea that people should have access to government data online without having to make a request has become a default expectation. I'm still not quite sure how we got here this fast. Sunlight has been a big part of it. So have you. So has this administration. So have thousands of people around the world who all decided that this was a good idea. Now there's some downsides. Putting some data on the internet turns out to have negative consequences. If I put up a data set with geolocations above uh, every person who owns a handgun in a state, I might also turn up prison guards and people who are trying to hide from uh, domestic abuse. That's what New York State did. Now, the state didn't do it. A journalist took that data, put it on the internet, and then the state changed the law and they stopped disclosing those handgun registration uh, data sets under FOIA. In an age of weaponized transparency, where agencies and individuals are hacked and that data is leaked, you can see how the idea of open government data could become something people are concerned about. So we have to build in the idea that there are privacy and security harms that are associated with these things. We have to look at how and where data can be used to discriminate and by whom. We have to think through what aspects of communications should be open to the public and what should not. I fervent believe that the scientific method means that what you create should be subject to peer review. The methodology should be subject to peer review. The transformation of it should be subject to public scrutiny. The results should be available. The data itself behind it, something you all are deeply involved in, should be archived for the future. Should the communications of the scientists themselves be available in real time or even in delayed sense? What, if, what impact will that have? I'm not sure where these conversations are gonna end up. I can tell you that there is a huge amount of friction over them right now at the state and federal level. And we all need to be very careful to think through what the right balance is. We push for the idea that if it's public, it should be online. Well, I'm not sure we need that law anymore. Congress passes the POIA, we would be happy to celebrate. But I think that's become a default expectation. And my hope, our hope, is that that default expectation is not something that any of us will allow to be reset. We won't let that hard drive be scrubbed or corrupted. This is our data. It belongs to us. Our scientific agencies, our statistical agencies, are a national treasure. When I've traveled to other countries and talked about opening up data, people talk to us about the extraordinary richness and quality of the data that our statistical agencies and our scientists publish. So this is what's at stake. This is what lies ahead. I am fundamentally hopeful that we all together will be able to protect and defend the integrity of government data, that we'll be able to use science to inform the public, to improve public health, and to build a better world protect our environment and our oceans, and to ensure that what we leave for our children, 
the three and a half year old daughter is not more foul than it already is. This is not the talk I wanted to give, but it's the one I have to. And I'll leave it there. If you have questions, have at it.